Good. All right. So hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'm Katrina Jackman, and uh, I lead a planetary magnetospheres research group at DIAS. So today I'm going to talk to you. Um, I'm going to introduce you to what a planetary magnetosphere is and uh, give you a background into effectively the field of planetary space weather. So how the sun influences magnetized planets in our solar system. And uh, the uh, left hand diagram, of course, is, is an illustration of our solar system. And when I'm talking about magnetized planets, I'm really thinking of planets that have a, a significant and large magnetic field, which leads to the generation of a significant structure called a magnetosphere around those planets. And, and so for the purposes of, of my definition of a magnetosphere, those planets include uh, Mercury, Earth, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Nothing against Venus and Mars, but their magnetospheres are, are more of the induced variety. Um, and the figure on the right, you may have already seen, uh, or at least something like it this week. And that's just showing the sun, you know, our local dynamic explosive star, which is the source of the solar wind, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. And that solar wind can shape uh, the magnetic fields around planets and form something called a magnetosphere. The inside of a magnetosphere, are you seeing my pointer? Maybe? Yep. I'll see, I'll see you are. Okay. So the inside of the magnetosphere uh, is, is the region that is that contains and is controlled by the planetary magnetic field and the planetary plasma. And then outside you've got the interplanetary magnetic field, which is the remnant of the sun's magnetic field and, and the planetary uh, um, yeah, the, sorry, the solar wind um, plasma. So let's start by introducing the sun. Uh, I think Peter might have showed this exact figure here on the left, and perhaps others did as well, but certainly for me, I always like to hear things uh, more than once. So um, the sun uh, has a solar cycle, the 11 year cycle of, of changes in its activity, and its characteristics are very different from solar minimum to solar maximum. We learned a lot about this from the Ulysses spacecraft. And this pair of figures on the left is showing you uh, solar minimum versus solar maximum and the changes that come about in the, the face of the sun and in the structure of the interplanetary magnetic field. So the interplanetary magnetic field is uh, illustrated by these arrows where red shows outward directed IMF and blue shows inward directed IMF. So for this particular orientation of the sun's field, it was outward in the northern hemisphere and inward in the south. Um, but this figure also gives information about the velocity of the solar wind. So how, how quickly that solar wind plasma is, is heading out into the heliosphere to, to wreak its, uh, its influence on uh, planets that lie in its path. And so, Typically at this uh, phase of the solar cycle, we see a pretty ordered sun at solar minimum. So we're seeing faster solar wind emanating from sort of open um, kind of holes. And then we have the more sort of closed field arcades down here near, near the equator. So the, the longer arrows denoting faster solar wind and then the, the, the um, shorter arrows denoting slower solar wind. And that picture is totally changed when you get to solar maximum. So the, the pattern, of uh, solar wind speeds and the pattern of inward and outward directed IMF is, is just all over the place and, and, and extremely disordered. Um, as I mentioned, this goes with the solar cycle. So this figure, I'm sure again, you've seen many like this uh, in the past couple of days, shows sunspot number versus time <clears throat> from pre-1960 through to 2030. So this actually includes a prediction for upcoming solar cycles. This one is, is just one of many. This one is actually based on a machine learning approach to learn from past cycles and um, predict what the sun is going to do into the future. That is a whole field in itself of solar cycle prediction, but you can see um, the, the approximate 11 year uh, pattern in sunspots. And so uh, I just show you this figure again, which I showed you on the first slide, which just is to, to place this solar wind in context. So when we're thinking about how the sun and the solar wind is impacting on planetary magnetospheres, we always have to bear in mind, you know, what phase of the solar cycle are we at? What kind of an interplanetary magnetic field structure are we likely to be seeing? 
um, and how is the pattern of fast and slow solar winds going to mediate that relationship between the solar wind and the planetary environment. So uh, the movie on the left is showing the formation of the magnetosphere starting at the sun, source of the solar wind, flowing out into the heliosphere relatively unimpeded until it encounters the obstacle of a magnetized planet, then most of the flow is deflected around the planet. But there is interaction, particularly at the boundaries of the magnetosphere between the solar wind and the planetary field and planetary plasma. That can lead to processes like magnetic reconnection, which I'll talk about later, which in turn set up a series of electrical currents, which can result in all kinds of wave particle interactions and precipitation of energetic particles along magnetic field lines and then the production of the aurora, which uh, is, is a very, very beautiful thing and a very interesting uh, space plasma physics phenomenon to study. And so you know, at the, the core, <clears throat> literally, magnetosphere, uh, certainly for the case of the Earth, is dynamo action, producing this magnetic field, which of course is invisibly stretching these large distances out into space. And there's that picture again, just as one more time, so to remind us of where these magnetospheres sort of lie and, and their, their relationship uh, to the sun. So here's just a static image of the magnetosphere because I, I'm going to introduce a couple of terms which I will mention later on in the talk. And I, I please stop me if there's jargon that you feel I haven't explained because otherwise um, people get lost and, and then nobody learns anything. So don't be shy if you have it happen. Um, okay, <clears throat> so the solar wind we've already talked about in this diagram, the sun is off to the left, so the solar wind is in green and shaping the magnetosphere. And then there are two key boundaries, which I will talk about in a bit more detail later. The first is the bow shop, where the supersonic solar wind flow is abruptly slowed because it senses magnetic obstacle ahead of it. Then the next boundary is the magnetopause, <clears throat> and this is shown by this dash line. And the magnetopause marks the boundary between the region called the magnetosheath, which is a region of shocked, slowed, turbulent, compressed solar wind. So the solar wind that has sort of had the brakes put on it at the bow shock. So you've got the magnetosheath on one side of the magnetopause, and then on the other side is the magnetosphere, the region which is dominated by the planetary field and planetary plasma. You may also hear me mention the terms day side and night side. So the day side of the magnetosphere, the side facing the sun, the night side or the magnetic tail of the magnetosphere, the side facing away from the sun. And you can see these white lines here, this is Saturn's magnetosphere, representing the approximately dipolar planetary magnetic field. But on the night side or in the magnetic tail, this field is really stretched out into, um, into a long um, magnetic tail shape directed away, away from the sun and shaped by that solar wind. Are all magnetospheres the same? No, is the short answer. Um, but, you know, in the interest of the scientific integrity, I will um, expand on that a little bit. So here is a cartoon illustrating four of uh, key magnetospheres in our solar system, starting with the smallest, Mercury, through to Earth, through to Saturn, and through to Jupiter. Jupiter's magnetosphere is an absolute beast. It is the single biggest coherent object in our solar system. And, you know, Jupiter is just the planet of superlatives. It's just got the biggest everything. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's my favorite planet. Um, I think Saturn uh, holds a special place in my heart because I worked on the Cassini mission for 15 years. Um, but Jupiter is certainly a very hot um, planet at the moment. Uh, NASA's Juno spacecraft is there, and there are two other spacecrafts that are heading there soon. So what makes, why, why would you want to study more than one magnetosphere? Why would you even want to study one? Well, the study of individual magnetospheres is worth much more than the sum of their individual parts. They're so different um, and in a couple of key ways. Firstly, in planetary field strength. So Mercury is, is just puny. It's barely able to hold off the solar winds. Its planetary field strength is about 150 times weaker than the Earth's. So it's actually thought that at times when the solar wind is really strong, the solar wind is actually able to compress Mercury's magnetopause in onto the surface of the planet. So you can actually have direct entry um, or direct impact of solar wind particles on the face of Mercury. Compare that to Jupiter, <clears throat> where the magnetopause is, is you know, 60 to, to 90 
planetary radii away from um, the surface of, of or the, the, the cloud tops, I should say, of Jupiter. So field strength is, is variable and that controls the size of the magnetosphere. Planetary rotation rate is variable. Here, Mercury is, is also um, sort of bringing up the, the tail of the distribution and that's a very, very slow rotator. Uh, whereas planets like Jupiter and Saturn just whip around in you know, 10 or so hours. And that really rapid rotation of those planets introduces significant centrifugal forces and that sort of uh, changes the mix of plasma dynamics in those environments. Upstream conditions vary significantly. So the solar wind that Mercury's magnetosphere sees is not the same solar wind as Saturn's magnetosphere. So over the course of nine astronomical units from the sun, the, the conditions in the heliosphere evolve significantly and that has an impact on the solar wind magnetosphere coupling. And then the fourth way in which these magnetospheres are different is that Jupiter and Saturn have significant internal plasma sources. So they have volcanic moons which are orbiting deep within their magnetospheres, Iowa, Jupiter, Enceladus, and Saturn, and these produce uh, uh, neutral materials initially, which then become ionized and form a, a torus or, or a donut of material around the equatorial plane. And again, you know, what goes in must come out from a magnetosphere. So if you're adding a load of material, that has an impact on um, plasma uh, mass transports and, and, and loss and uh, implications for uh, the dynamics of those magnetosphere. So I, I won't um, <clears throat> labor this slide too much. Uh, you know, what is space weather? Well, hopefully <laughs> by day four of a space weather workshop, um, we have some clue, um, but it, it describes conditions on the sun and, and usually in the Earth's magnetosphere, uh, which are, are changing and which can have an impact on our technological infrastructure. I know Peter showed you a version of this left-hand figure a couple of days ago. Um, the authors of this one felt the need to um, point out that the objects here are not shown to scale, just so I thought I would, you know, emphasize that in case that isn't clear. Um, but this illustrates just some of the ways in which um, space weather can impact um, the technological infrastructure upon which modern life relies. And so um, partly um, in response to the technological need to understand space weather, and, and partly in, in, uh, in response to the, the relative ease with which it can be studied, there are a huge number of spacecraft monitoring the terrestrial system, the, the, the Sun-Earth system. So there are spacecraft which are monitoring the Sun. I'm sure you've already heard a lot about you know, Solar Orbiter in particular, given Dias's leadership um, with that particular mission. But there are also a huge number of spacecraft, constellations of spacecraft that are orbiting within the Earth's magnetosphere to give us the as complete a picture as possible of <clears throat> what the sun is emitting, what that looks like directly upstream of the Earth, for example, with spacecraft like ACE, and how the magnetosphere is responding. So Earth is by far the best sampled system, but we do have tools to probe the solar system elsewhere. So at Mercury, uh, we've had the Messenger Orbiter and um, ESA's Bepi Colombo mission is currently on the way. Its first flyby is gonna be in October of this year. So we're really, really excited to see the coming results from that. Um, space of the Earth. We've had a lot of flybys um, of Jupiter, spacecraft which some of you might've heard of like Pioneer and Voyager. The first orbiter at Jupiter was the Galileo spacecraft back in the late nineties. And then right now, NASA's Juno spacecraft is there. And then the missions that I alluded to earlier, which are being planned, are ESA's JUICE mission and NASA's Europa Clipper. At Saturn, we've had orbiters, again, Pioneer and Voyager era, and then the amazingly successful Cassini mission, which orbited um, from uh, 2004 and spent 13 years studying the Saturn system. The, the real missing piece in the puzzle of solar system exploration is the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. We've flown by them with Voyager, got the nearest sort of tantalizing glimpse of what they're like, but we must go there. They are intriguing bodies from so many perspectives, from magnetospheric and space plasma physics, from moons, from astrobiology, from just understanding where everything fits in that solar system puzzle. Um, but in addition to the kind of spacecraft which have orbited 
or flown by these um, planets. We also have remote sensing tools to understand uh, planetary space weather. And these include uh, ultraviolet telescopes like Hubble, which is an Earth orbiting telescope, which studies in particular Jupiter and Saturn in terms of solar system science. And then we also have a number of X-ray telescopes, again, which are Earth orbiting. And these include Chandra, XMM, and New Star, uh, which we at DIAS use to study planets uh, like Jupiter. Okay, so I have already uh, hinted at, at Juno. So I said Juno arrived um, actually on the 4th of July um, in 2016 at Jupiter. So just celebrating the five-year anniversary, it was revolutionizing. And, and I know it sounds like a cliche to say it's rewriting the textbooks on Jupiter, but it actually is because we didn't know what was inside Jupiter before. We really didn't have a good sense of the chemical differentiation, what was the extent of the core, what was the strength of its um, magnetic field. Juno is finding those things out. And in, the reason why it's able to find those things out is because it's taking a big risk with its orbit. So its orbits take it really, really close to the planet. So right over the cloud tops at Perigeau, which is the closest point, and then right through the magnetic field lines, which thread down and form Jupiter's aurora um, at high latitudes. But also over the course of the mission, the orbits kind of wrap Jupiter in this sort of cosmic web, if you like, and cover all latitudes and longitudes. And that enables extremely precise measurements um, of the gravitational field and the magnetic field and allow us to unlock the mysteries of Jupiter's magnetic field and its polar magnetosphere and auroral emissions. See, and uh, spent, as I said, 13 years at Saturn. Its orbit uh, was much less organized looking than, than um, Juno's. It looks like, you know, you let your cat go crazy with um, a ball of string. But, I mean, it was obviously highly planned and looked at Saturn from every angle, north, south, east, west, moons, rings, atmosphere, magnetosphere, an amazing mission, and then a, a planned um, death dive deorbit into Saturn's atmosphere at the end uh, in 2017. So what I want to do uh, for the, the rest of, not the rest of today, just the next you know, half hour or so, um, is kind of take you through um, planetary space weather in, um, at, with a focus on the outer planets in, in three key ways. And so those are looking at the sort of upstream medium, um, so interplanetary space, magnetospheric boundaries, and remote sensing. And so to do that, I just need to briefly tell you you know, what lots of spacecraft data I'm going to be introducing you to. So at um, the top here shows the trajectory of some of these key spacecraft which have visited Jupiter. So the Galileo orbiter, which I mentioned, and then the Juno orbiter is shown here in black, with these very, very organized orbits. And Juno has actually just been extended to 2025, so lots more great science to come. Um, the figure on the right, both panels are the same, just with different labels. So both show sunspot number versus time from 1970 to 2020. And the top panel shows the spacecraft which have um, uh, flown by with the vertical lines. So Pioneer 10, 11, Voyager 1 and 2, Ulysses, Cassini and New Horizon. And then spacecraft which have orbited, so Galileo and Juno. And then the same <clears throat> in the bottom for Saturn. So the trajectories of the spacecraft that have visited, black is Cassini, and then red, green and blue, um, apologies for colorblind. Um, are Pioneer and Voyager. And again, you can see where they have um, visited in terms of the solar cycle. So the key message to take away from, from this slide is that we have coverage at Jupiter and Saturn at all phases of the solar cycle. So we have the ability to study not only different seasons on these planets because of the long duration of the missions, but also solar min and solar max and, and all of the variable parameter space that that brings with it in terms of um, solar wind, magnetosphere, ionosphere. <clears throat> so let's start with interplanetary space. Second time I've shown you these today and, and third or probably fourth time you've seen these this week. A reminder of the difference between solar min on the left and solar max on the right. So what is interplanetary space like when you get out to 5 AU for Jupiter or 9 AU for Saturn? Well, it's a pretty um, organized place. And part of that is because of something called co-rotating interaction regions, which I, I kind of think of as like an interplanetary traffic jam. So 
fast solar wind sort of getting impatient and sort of slamming into the back of the slow solar wind and pushing it forward. And then slow solar wind lagging behind um, the fast solar wind and causing these sort of rare faction regions. By the time you get out to the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn, the compressions and rare factions associated with co-rotating interaction regions are quite well developed. You can see that in this panel here, which is the result of an MHD simulation, where time is increasing down the y-axis and heliospheric distance is increasing along the x-axis. And what starts off as quite a small um, deflection in interplanetary magnetic field strength B here, starts to steepen into um, shocks and into um, you know, a structure of compressions and rarefactions and ultimately into something called a merged interaction region here in the bottom panel. Uh, we also see this, this is an MHD simulation, but we also see this in data. This figure is showing you uh, one solar rotation, 25 and a half days as seen from Saturn and is showing the difference between rarefaction, this is interplanetary magnetic field strength, which is really low in a rarefaction region and compression regions where we see a significant um, sort of shock and steepening of this um, interplanetary magnetic field strength. So you just have to think <clears throat> if you're in the magnetosphere, you're being buffeted alternately by these rarefactions, which tend to be low magnetic field strength, low solar wind dynamic pressure, and then compressions, which are high interplanetary magnetic field strength, strong um, solar wind dynamic pressure. And so that sort of solar wind driver being almost kind of on, off, on, off, and that having an implication for the dynamics um, of the magnetosphere. So what does that actually look like in terms of plasma data? So in terms of the electrons and ions that we can measure in situ um, in the solar wind and, and the associated um, plasma velocities and dynamic pressure as well. Um, here are some examples from Cassini upstream of Saturn. So this is sort of 20 days worth of data when Cassini was on its way upstream, uh, heading towards Saturn. And this is the um, proton density in the top panel and the solar wind velocity here. And you can see sort of shocks being associated with uh, the magnetic field starting to increase um, field magnitude shown here in black. Problem at the outer planets <clears throat> is that unlike the Earth, we don't always have an upstream monitor. In fact, we hardly ever have an upstream monitor, right? So we have a single spacecraft which goes into orbit around these planets and you are then somewhat lacking in context of the observations. And so um, we have to be creative. And, and one way in which we do that is to use models. So models which take observations from the Earth, from one of you, and propagate them out into the outer heliosphere. And so um, what we can do then is, is validate them against times when we do have observations. So here is an example of solar wind speed, density, and interplanetary magnetic field strength, where the blue is the propagated model and the orange is the observed data. And the models do reasonably well, <clears throat> but uh, only with some parameters. And so this bottom panel is showing um, correlation coefficient of, of certain model parameters as a function of time from apparent opposition. So where um, the Earth observations were taken relative to um, where uh, Jupiter or Saturn were at the time. And without going into massive detail on this figure, I'll just say that the blue line has the highest correlation coefficient. That's solar wind velocity. The purple line, which is the normal component of the magnetic field, has the poorest correlation coefficient. So if essentially, we're pretty much unable to propagate uh, with any degree of fidelity the interplanetary magnetic field orientation from Earth out to Jupiter and Saturn. It's just such a turbulent medium. There's just so much going on. But we are reasonably well able to preserve these fast and slow solar winds and, and propagate that velocity well. So, you know, a buyer beware when you're using a, an MHD model and, and just um, some awareness of which parameters are propagated well is, is really important. Um, just very briefly, the sun can also have a, an extremely direct influence on outer planet magnetospheres through um, an ionization process. So I mentioned that Jupiter and Saturn have these volcanic moons. Saturn has the moon Enceladus. 
and um, Jupiter has a moon Io. They <clears throat> um, emit large amounts of neutral material, which in turn becomes ionized by processes such as electron impact ionization at Jupiter and photo ionization at Saturn. But it's been found that these reaction rates can change by a factor of up to five with solar cycle. So the bottom line is when you're at solar maximum, you have more internal plasma being produced because of an increase in these ionization rates. And a second way in which the sun can directly influence these magnetosphere is through the relationship between solar cycle, so sunspot numbers shown here, and EUV irradiance, which is a pretty good correlation. So EUV irradiance goes up with, with uh, solar cycle, as does conductivity, as do the field aligned currents, which directly uh, link in to the, the main aurora global emissions at Jupiter and Saturn. So when, when we think of solar influence, it's tempting to just think about a solar wind, but actually um, the sun can, can directly impact things like um, conductivities and plasma production rates. Okay. The next um, area which I want to talk about is magnetospheric boundaries. So I mentioned that, you know, we don't have an upstream monitor at Jupiter and Saturn. So, you know, we've got the sun, this is the Earth here. Um, you know, if we're studying the Earth's magnetosphere, we have spacecraft like ACE, which are just parked upstream of the Earth, and they are measuring the solar wind that is about to hit us. We don't get a, you know, lots of notice, but we have that constant sort of sentinel to say this is, you know, what the solar wind is um, is about to do to the magnetosphere. And so when you have spacecraft orbiting within the magnetosphere, you also have the upstream context. <laughs> That's missing at the outer planets. And that is a, a huge um, uh, challenge. Um, it, it makes things difficult. If I was writing a grant proposal, I would say it's, it's, you know, it's a challenge and it's an opportunity to be creative. But when I'm talking to you, I'll say it just makes things really hard because we, um, we're flying blind quite often when we're inside the magnetosphere. We just don't, you know, we might see a really strong magnetospheric response, but we're, we kind of don't know what caused it. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, necessity is the mother invention. And so we have to use what we have. And the magnet sheath uh, really comes into its own here. So this is Earth's magnet sheath, this sort of fiery region. So if you remember, there's the solar wind, the bioshock, then the magnet sheath the turbulent, compressed, heated, um, subsonic flow that's been, you know, abruptly slowed down. And then beyond that is the magnetic wall and then the magnetosphere. So we do have significant coverage of the magnetic sheaths of both Jupiter and Saturn. We have coverage by Juno, which is these, I showed you this figure already, but these sort of dash lines, which are very, very regular, the Juno petal orbits just precessing around from dawn uh, to, the, to the middle of the tail. And Juno's apogee, so its furthest point from Jupiter, was around the nominal position of Jupiter's magnetopause. And so for many of the initial Juno orbits, um, at the farthest point from Jupiter, uh, Juno was spending a significant amount of time in the magneto sheath, so able to sample this shocked solar wind population. And in terms of what the data typically look like in the magneto sheath, I'm showing you that here in this bottom panel where we've got uh, Saturn at the center of the crosshairs, sun off to the right, uh, and then nominal magnetic pause positions. And these black lines showing the uh, magnitude and, and direction of the solar wind flow. And so what you can see, which is kind of intuitive, <clears throat> is that the solar wind flow uh, is slowed and deflected around the planet in the magnetic sheet. But, um, We've actually worked, um, this is a, one of my esteemed uh, collaborators, collaborator for many years, and we've worked together to take measurements in the magnetic sheath and, and using an energy balance argument associated with um, the, the transfer of energy across the magnetic pulse boundary, we've been able to take those magnetic sheath measurements and use the temperature of protons in the magnetic sheath to infer the upstream solar wind velocity. So in this way, we can uh, even though we're not in the solar wind, even though we're in the magnetic sheath, we can infer the properties upstream. So this gives us uh, more of an insight into what might be driving the magnetosphere. <clears throat> I want to briefly mention um, you know, the magnetospheric boundaries themselves. So we have very clear signatures in magnetic field and plasma when we cross magnetospheric boundaries. So the solar wind 
um, in, in orange <clears throat> has a distinct character. It's, it's low interplanetary magnetic field strength. It's usually fairly quiet. The magnetic sheath has a distinct character. It's this heated, turbulent, compressed, um, uh, very, very noisy magnetic field. And then the magnetosphere has a specific character. It's more intense magnetic field. Of course, you're getting closer to the planet and a particular orientation of the magnetic field associated with the planetary dipole. So we can identify, and in fact, we have identified every single time that the Cassini spacecraft at Saturn crossed the magnetopause, shown by these red dots, and the bow shock, that's what BS is short for, um, shown by these blue dots. So once we have all those boundary crossings, that tells us about the pressure balance between the solar wind pushing from the outside and the planetary field and plasma kind of resisting from the inside. And we can see the effects of solar wind compression in terms of rapid motion of these boundaries. They're constantly in motion to achieve pressure balance between inside and outside. And so um, using the boundaries to understand the, the physics of how the, the solar wind is, is changing both the shape and the location of those boundaries is a really interesting field. Um, I mentioned reconnection. I, I think this has been discussed probably this week in the context of um, <clears throat> you know, solar flares or, or CMEs, for example. So this kind of mesmerizing GIF on the left uh, is a very simplified uh, idea of what's happening in reconnection, where you have oppositely directed field lines traveling in to meet each other. They break, they, they merge, they, they reconfigure, and in doing so, they transfer huge amounts of mass, momentum, and energy from one system to another. So two key places in the planetary magnetosphere where reconnection can happen. The first is at the day side between the planetary field and the interplanetary magnetic field. And that's uh, kind of shown here in this figure on the right. The second key place is on the night side in the magnetic tail between the northern and southern lobe regions in the sort of night side current sheet. The extent to which dayside reconnection plays a role in driving the magnetospheres of Jupiter and Saturn is a topic which makes otherwise civilized adults use some quite unprofessional language, I would say. It's, it's a really hot topic, a topic of intense debate um, in the outer planets community, but I, I won't <clears throat> kind of wade into that debate too deeply today, other than to say that there are lots of factors which influence the rate at which reconnection can happen. So we have a, this is my only equation today, um, day four, I didn't want to scare you too much, but essentially the day side reconnection voltage is characterized by the velocity of the solar wind uh, times the perpendicular component of the magnetic field. Uh, and there's a, there's a cause to the four relationship of theta, which is a clock angle, um, which is essentially a metric of the degree of anti-parallelness of the interplanetary magnetic field and the planetary field. And then this kind of magic number, L0, which is a sort of empirically derived extent of the magnetopause, which might be unstable to reconnection. But there are lots of factors which can influence this reconnection rate and, and kind of end up being Kind of subsumed into this L0 number. And those include the Mach number of the solar wind, they include the degree of flow shear um, at the boundary, they include the plasma beta in the magnetic sheath or the change in plasma beta across the magnetic pole. Um, but there are in situ observations of reconnection happening at Jupiter and Saturn. The degree to which it dominates everything is, is an open question. Um, very, very briefly, again, um, you might have had mention of solar energetic particle events uh, in the context of uh, coronal mass ejections. This is kind of a, a schematic sketch of that today. And I will just say that um, <clears throat> Cassini at Saturn can, or, or could, uh, when it was alive, um, make measurements of SEPs and galactic cosmic rays um, from inside the magnetosphere of Saturn. So a, a rare case of where we... we again, can get around this lack of an upstream monitor. Um, and so the um, energetic particle instrument on Cassini could measure things called Forbush decreases and could measure changes in these SEPs and use those to link energetic heliospheric processes like coronal mass ejections and CIRs to processes that are seen sort of deep 
in solid patterns my magnetosphere and so um that's that's kind of another creative way of using using the data to infer what's going on upstream so for the last um sort of 10 minutes or so i want to talk about um remote sensing of planetary magnetospheres which is going to lead into Karen Tan's talk uh, which is coming after mine so how do we use a different wavelengths, you know, radio, UV, X-ray, to remotely sense uh, the dynamics of planetary magnetosphere and to remotely sense the influence of, of um, planetary space weather? So <clears throat> again, you know, you will have heard loads about radio emission today. So this is probably or this week, I should say. You know, this is like super uh, simple cartoon. Um, not to scale. I should also emphasize again a spacecraft and planet not to scale. Um, otherwise that would be a pretty amazing spacecraft. So for uh, the case of Saturn for starters, Saturn's primary radio mission is something called SKOR, Saturn Kilometric Radiation. And the name is also of course derived from uh, the frequency range in which it is observed. And it is typically a thought to emerge from radio sources which are situated on auroral field lines. And it is a radio emission which is generated by the cyclotron maser instability. And so the frequency of the radio emission is inversely proportional to the altitude of the source. So this is just a frequency time spectrogram of SKR as measured by the Cassini radio instrument, where the color bar is just the, the intensity of the radio emission. And so back, you know, in the 80s, um, the there were initial studies sort of the Voyager era where there there were attempts to link um the SKOR energy with things like the ram pressure and the magnitude of the interplanetary magnetic field and those correlations seem to be pretty strong and um, and now we we can even go a step further and show that show the specific effects of space weather disturbances in terms of both an intensification in the radio emission but also a change in the frequency. So we often see features which we call LFEs or low frequency extensions of the radio emission, which correspond to a growth uh, in the altitude of the radio source, which we think is a response to increased precipitation of energetic particles into that auroral zone as a response to a dynamic magnetospheric event. At Jupiter, um, life is more complicated than it is at Saturn. Um, Jupiter's radio emissions are incredibly interesting and incredibly dynamic. So <clears throat> this is a really nice um, image uh, figure from Philippe Zarka's work, which shows a flux density as a function of frequency for the different planetary radio emissions in our solar system. And so in my group in Dias, we study in particular um, the Earth's uh, AKR, auroral kilometric radiation, uh, SKR, and then the Jovian radio emissions, which Carantan will explain much more about shortly. But you know, key uh, key things to say about Jupiter's radio emissions, they're detectable from the ground. So we're using LOFAR and specifically ILOFAR, along with some other um, European nodes to measure them. Uh, <clears throat> what else about them? They're, they're complicated. They have many components. They have decametric components, they have hectometric components, they have kilometric components, there's narrowband. There's emissions which are linked to IO. There are um, indications that the Jovian radio emission can be linked to um, upstream conditions. So this figure, which has a lot of labels and a lot going on, um, but the, the main crux of the figure is that it shows for Jupiter, the propagated interplanetary magnetic field strength in this black trace, and then the radio power um, as measured um, from Jupiter. And the bottom line is that the components of the radio power, um, which are, are thought to be, um, you know, not linked to IO, which are thought to be linked to upstream conditions, tend to um, peak and correlate well with um, the strongest solar wind compression. So these FFS, which stands for fast forward shocks, um, are matched very well with uh, these um, solar wind compressions and much more to do on tying down in particular that timeline for you know when the solar wind compresses Jupiter's magnetosphere how long does it take for those wave particle interactions to be uh, have their influence felt in terms of the Jovian radio response 
And that's something which we in my group are, are going to be looking at a lot in the coming years. Um, very briefly, ultraviolet aurora. So, you know, whenever you Google planetary aurora, that's probably most of what you're going to see. This was actually on the right hand side, um, a set of images, which was on the cover of Nature magazine back in 2005. It was a Hubble take space telescope campaign from January 2004, uh, when Cassini was upstream of Saturn, so on its way to Saturn. And it shows just the incredible beauty and diversity of Saturn's auroral radio emissions, which sometimes take the form of a quiet oval around the pole, sometimes take the form of something which we call a dawn storm, which is this kind of infilling of one side of the um, polar region, and sometimes take this really bright spiral. And these are actually shown here. Um, these are, of course, on the right-hand side, uh, superimposed onto visible images of Saturn, and these are just the pure um, Hubble images showing yeah, the dawn storm, the spiral, and then the kind of standard quiet oval. Um, you know, you may have heard the phrase that the aurora is the TV screen for the magnetosphere, but it's, it's an amazing way to um, understand, um, you know, where these currents are mapping to. And for the case of Saturn, the main ultraviolet emission is linked directly to flux content in the magnetosphere and it's to the action of the solar wind because the, the main auroral emission is formed at what we call this open closed field line boundary. So the, the closed field lines shown in red, the open field lines shown in blue, which become opened because of day sun reconnection, they all have their feet um, in the auroral region and the size of that open closed field line boundary changes as you change the amount of flux in the system through opening magnetic flux by reconnecting at the day side and closing magnetic flux through reconnecting in the tail. So the aurora is a, a great way of, of remotely sensing magnetospheric dynamics. At Jupiter, <clears throat> Jupiter also, um, of course, has an ultraviolet aurora, the, the most powerful in the solar system. Uh, it's not so much of an oval as a kind of a kidney bean shape. It's very curious that the main emission is not the same as Saturn. It's not caused by changes in, in amounts of open versus closed flux. The main UV emission at Jupiter is caused by something called co-rotation breakdown, which is linked to um, the volcanic moon Io, putting loads of plasma into the magnetosphere, and then the planet being unable to sustain that plasma in perfect co-rotation with the planet, and that leading to a set of currents and um, co-rotation forcing currents, which, which ultimately produce um, that main aurora logo. But there's loads of other features on Jupiter's aurora which are really interesting, including the moon footprint, so the Io footprint and tail, and then the Ganymede and Europa footprints that were associated with, um, principally specifically associated with the Galilean satellites. But arguably one of the most interesting and, and curious aspects of Jupiter's aurora is its polar aurora. So these very, very bright and variable polar emissions and their source is, is anyone's guess, but um, one of the, the major um, questions in the, in the Juno community at the moment. Um, we also have X-ray emissions from Jupiter, both from the polar regions and from the disk. This is a Chandra X-ray observatory uh, HRC um, image of Jupiter. You can see that the X-rays in the northern and southern rural regions are by far brighter uh, than the ones on the disk. And actually, north is significantly brighter than south on average. The, the auroral emissions are found to, to pulse um, with, with, with variable periods and um, with a driver, which may be linked to you know, wave particle interactions in the magnetosphere. But the disk tells us something about the sun because the previous work and, and work that's ongoing as we speak in my group is looking at um, X-rays from Jupiter's disk, which are thought to be scattered solar X-rays. So in that sense, Jupiter can all, almost act as kind of the mirror for what the sun is doing and a direct response um, to changes in, in solar X-ray flux. And that's something which we're, we're actively um, trying to quantify and, and understand more about. Okay, the second to last thing I'll say is, you know, what happens when the solar wind disappears? Well, uh, we have an opportunity 
once every 19 years to explore this question. And that's because once every 19 years, there is a planetary alignment such that Saturn is sort of directly behind Jupiter as seen from the sun and the earth. And because Jupiter's magnetosphere is so enormous, its magnetotail actually stretches all the way to the orbit of Saturn. And so uh, back in the Voyager era, when um, we had Voyager measurements in situ at Saturn, Saturn found its way in this alignment into Jupiter's magnetotail, and that resulted in an almost complete extinction of the SKR, of the Saturn Kilometric uh, Radio Mission, and really sharp changes in the plasma environment of Saturn and, and local density dropouts and so on. And so, because in, instead of being in the nominal solar wind, Saturn was actually in Jupiter's extremely rarefied magnetotail and so a really strange parameter space. So this opportunity came up again uh, last year, November 2020. Now this time there was no in situ spacecraft at Saturn, but there was a rural monitoring, which we'd never had before. So there was a significant Hubble campaign um, led by a colleague at the University of Leicester. And then there was a Chandra campaign uh, led by my PhD student, Dale Waite, um, from the University of Southampton and, and now at Dias. And so the kind of questions that we were trying to answer was, you know, what happens when you just switch off the solar wind? You can do this in a simulation, but it's so rare to have the opportunity to do that um, uh, I was going to say in real life, but, you know, with, with observational data. Um, and also, you know, is solar wind interaction required for the existence of Saturn's main aurora oval? Like, would you see anything at all if you switch off the solar wind? Um, so certainly for the X-rays, uh, we actually had a non-detection of X-rays from Saturn. We had detected them previously, but when, um, when we looked for this campaign, it seemed that the conditions at Saturn were, were just not conducive at the time for the for um, X-ray generation. The Hubble campaign results are still being analyzed. They're actually being presented this week um, at the Magnetospheres of the Outer Planets Conference. And so they will hopefully be um, emerging into the public domain in the coming months. But a really interesting opportunity to take advantage of a, a rare um, planetary alignment. So I'll just finish by saying I've given you kind of a, a whistle-stop tour of um, the outer heliosphere. So we've looked at, you know, what is a magnetosphere, but then we've looked at sort of interplanetary space and, and how we measure and model field and plasma through the heliosphere and, and how we have to bear in mind that the solar wind that we see at Mercury or Earth is not the same solar wind that we see at Jupiter and Saturn. There's significant evolution. And that's really important to, to consider when we're looking at the, the influence of the magnetosphere coupling at the outer planets. I also mentioned the case for direct solar wind influence on neutral torus ionization rates and on conductivities, which affect the aurora. Then we looked at magnetospheric boundaries in terms of how they respond to the pressure balance of the solar wind, how we can infer upstream conditions from crossings, and give you sort of a bit of insight into the, the hot debate about uh, the role of dayside reconnection at those magnetospheres. And then I sort of give you a brief overview um, of remote sensing in terms of radio, UV and X-ray. And Karantan is going to go into far more detail um, on, on how we, we uh, study and understand radio emissions in particular um, at the giant planets. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm happy to, to take any questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Katrina. Um, does anyone have any questions to start off? Hey, oh, Katrina, hi. that was really great. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jenny. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I I have a question of how long does it how long does it last when Saturn is kind of shielded by Jupiter? How long? Did oh, it great question. Last? Yeah, so it's sort of two to three days at a time. So for that particular. Um, episode of, of Saturn passing through Jupiter's tail, the, the entire kind of window was, was about sort of 20 to 30 days. But the thought is that Jupiter's magnetic tail is actually kind of flapping around during that time. So that um, based on the Voyager observations, the expectation was that Saturn would alternately find itself in the solar wind and in Jupiter's magnetic tail every sort of two to three days. 
which in itself is really interesting because that could potentially lead to quite strong shocks because you're going from really, really rarefied Jovian tail to sort of nominal solar wind and back. And um, we don't typically see that kind of change in um, plasma density in, in that's kind of outside of the normal normal parameter space of the nominal solar winds. So it's an opportunity to look at potentially extra strong shocks. Um, so it's, yeah, it's great to take advantage of that, that alignment. Really interesting. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Pierce, do you, want to, do you want a question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, hopefully a quick one. Uh, you mentioned the seasonal variation or, or mm -hmm. is there a seasonal variation? I don't, I, I don't understand why. <laughs> I don't understand. Sure. It's just because, because of the, the tilt. And so um, when, for example, with Saturn, when Cassini got there, it was Southern Hemisphere summer. So the Southern Hemisphere was more illuminated by the sun than the Northern Hemisphere was. And so that has implications for conductivities in particular. Um, and so we were always interested in understanding the conjugacy or otherwise of the aurora in the north and south. So is the aurora the same in the north and the south? And if it isn't, is part of that due to um, increased solar influence on one hemisphere, which is causing this kind of asymmetric conductivity. And so we had Southern Hemisphere summer when Cassini got to Saturn, and then we went through Equinox, and then we went into Northern Hemisphere summer. So that is um, just one of the many amazing things about Cassini is that if you're going to spend 13 years on a planet, you get to see the different seasons. So you get to see different parts of a solar cycle, different seasons, you know, weather, just every kind of magnetospheric dynamics. And so you have an opportunity to try and disentangle which drivers, be they seasonal effects, solar cycle effects, small scale temporal effects associated with, you know, CIRs or whatnot. You have the ability to sort of disentangle those, those different drivers. Um, so that's, that's why seasons are, are cool on the outer planet. Well, thank you. Yeah, Cassini really was a really cool mission. Uh, Mohammed, do you have a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, actually, I, I have two questions. Uh, the sure. first one, uh, since the solar wind uh, density and speed at Jupiter are much lower than at the Earth, um, I was wondering why the auroral activity is so intense. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that because of the magnetic field of Jupiter? Because mm -hmm. it's very strong or something else? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, you pretty much um, <clears throat> answered it there. Actually, yeah, it's it's Jupiter's um, magnetic field is is really strong. Um, but the the main UV emission at Jupiter is driven, as I said, by this co-rotation enforcement current. So Io producing, you know, 500 kilograms every second of sulfur, which which becomes ionized and then you know, the planetary field lines are trying to drag this huge amount of material around with the planet. And they're able to do that out to a certain radial distance, but due to conservation of angular momentum, eventually um, that plasma is, is harder to, to drag around. And um, the atmosphere is not sufficiently able to exert enough torque to drag it around. And so it starts to fall behind co-rotation. And that leads to these really, really strong field line currents. So the, the strength of those currents is, is uh, um, the kind of factors which go into determining the strength of those currents include the planetary field strength and the plasma mass, um, mass loading rate. So absolutely Jupiter's auroras are, yes, spectacular. And, and I think another function of just the size of the system and, and the kind of powerful currents that flow there is illustrated by the fact that we see significant auroral X-rays at Jupiter, which we don't see at Saturn. And so Jupiter is often described as, as a really, well, a relatively accessible um, astrophysical analog for you know, exoplanets or, or you know, pulsars or other sort of rapidly rotating um, bodies. It's sort of the, the archetypal rapidly rotating magnetosphere on our doorstep that we can probe in situ. Um, so it's a, 
I don't work for Jupiter. I sound like I'm trying to like sell it to you, but yeah, it's it's a really great, um, it's a really great environment. You said you had a second question. Did you? Have oh yes, please. I, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, how do the Galilean moons uh, leave footprints on the oral or oral oval? Uh, because there is an image that shows uh, uh, bright uh, footprints. Mm -hmm. sure. uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> so Io, Ganymede, and Europa at least have um, resolvable footprints. Callisto, um, well, the, the jury is out, I think, on that one. But Io is is um, certainly the, the brightest footprint. And so as I mentioned, you know, Io is is producing, um, you know, the significance of, um, of neutral material, which then becomes ionized. So there is... Um, a current system of its own associated with IO. And those current systems are, are, are very localized. And then results, there's 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 a kind of an alphane wing um, associated with, with IO. And it um, it leads to that kind of discrete auroral spot and and the tail. Um, but it's I, I will just say in terms of the Jovian moons. Uh, I don't know if any of you sort of follow um, the European Space Agency's strategic plans, but in the sort of Voyage 2050 document, which ESA have just released, they have placed solar system, outer solar system moons in the top three science questions for the next sort of two decades. And so, you know, ESA is sending the JUICE mission. It's It was literally being like vibration tested, you know, last week. So it's sending JUICE uh, to Jupiter um, in the coming years and um, NASA is sending Europa Clipper. So there's a huge amount of interest in characterizing the Jovian moons in terms of their plasma environments, but also, of course, in terms of their habitability, which is another, another field of research altogether. Yes, thank you so much. Sure, thank you. Great. Uh, Cameron, do you have a question? Yeah, um, first of all, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, so I have the following question. So the moon regularly goes in and out of the, its uh, magnetosphere. And I know that there have been, um, obviously it doesn't have, you know, strong magnetic field or atmosphere or ionosphere. Mm -hmm. But I know that there have been observations of, uh, I think from the crater instrument of um, uh, albedo, uh, of energetic particles, which are basically, and, and presumably you could estimate in a, in a way uh, using these uh, observations, the effects of the solar wind on the, on the surface of the moon. I mean, is it possible to make any uh, parallels between the, observing the moon going in and out of the uh, Earth magnetosphere and Saturn going in and out of the uh, Jovian magnetosphere? Sure. Great question. So um, the moon that you are going to want to know most about, I would say, is Titan, which is Saturn's moon, which orbits at about 20 planetary radii from Saturn. And the nominal magnetopause position at Saturn is 22 to 27 Saturn radii. But under extreme solar wind compression, if Titan happens to be on the day side at the same time, Titan can and has found itself outside of Saturn's magnetosphere, either in the magnetosheath or indeed, I think once it found itself when we caught it in the solar wind. And that's really interesting because Titan has an atmosphere, a significant atmosphere. And so it's really interesting to see how that atmosphere can be changed and shaped by the moon passing out of the magnetosphere and into the magnetosheath or into the solar wind. So Titan, um, is, is interesting in, in that context in terms of finding itself in different magnetospheric regimes. Another fascinating moon for Jupiter is Ganymede, which has its own internal magnetic field and is going to be one of the main targets of um, the JUICE mission. And, you know, if you like magnetic fields, you've got two magnetic fields when you study Ganymede, because you've got Ganymede's magnetic field inside Jupiter's magnetic field. So that is... Um, terribly exciting for just understanding the, the configuration of a magnetic field inside another magnetic field. Um, I don't know whether Carantine is going to mention Ganymede or its, its associated radio mission, but 
that's a that's a really cool place to study too.